Hi, uh, welcome to tonight's lecture in the Going Public Lecture Series. This is number 23 by now. Tonight's lecture is within uh, the Engagement Craftsmanship, uh, which is headed by the curator Thomas Ohms, who is also one of our panelists tonight. But today's lecture will be introduced. There's Thomas. Hi. Uh, will be introduced by one of the tutors from uh, craftsmanship, and that is uh, Thierry Lagrange. Hi, Thierry. Uh, and uh, he will introduce our speakers of tonight. So I would like to give the floor to Thierry now. Thank you, Lilith. Thank you. I prepared a small text. Um, let me start with two anecdotes. In 2009, I was on a conference in Oslo, the Nordic Design Research Conference at the Architecture in High School. And I was there too early that day, and I was waiting. It was uh, the day before the conference started, and I had to set up a video installation. And at the same moment, Kati and Albio arrived too early too. They too had to prepare a part of that exhibition. So we met before the closed doors. And after the first day of the conference, I was already desperate because of the terrible coffee. But I'm a lucky guy, and Albio and Kati found out that the best barista worldwide was only at 300 meters of that place. And it was not a coincidence that they found that spot. It was about finding, finding a good craft and skillfully craftsman. The second anecdote, only a couple of weeks later, Albio and I were both, for another reason, during the same three days in Seoul, South Korea. And we went together to the Jeongdong, that's the traditional marketplace for traditional medicine, fermented food and other weird stuff. Um, and I had a focus on, let's say, cultural strangeness and the visual qualities of that fascinating place. And Albio was fascinated in the authenticity, in the making, in the activity. And for him, it was about the craft. Now, two anecdotes that lay at the base of our intense friendship. And if you meet a German and a Portuguese in Norway and South Korea, then you know that you have to treat these coincidences with care. Um, I don't know anyone other than Albio and Kati, who are so fascinated in the making, in no-nonsense making. But that is only their starting point. They start by finding craftsmen and looking at craftsmen, at their way of making things, their objects, their stories. They are probably the absolute experts on crafts in Portugal. And craft in Portugal is huge but at the same time, very fragile. So they spend time mapping the craft, then bringing it back to an audience. And for the past 10 years, they have been publishing books on Portuguese crafts, fantastic publications, crafts in their own right. They were commissioned by the government and local authorities to research the crafts in Lisbon and the whole country. And they spend time to understand how tacit knowledge is the operative force at the heart of local productions and making. But more importantly, both Albio and Kati are absolutely great product designers. In their way of working, it's design. It's about what you can do with the product, how and where you can use it, how it feels in your hand when you use it somehow their products have a soul of course because craftsmen made them but at least as important because Albion and Kati know how to bring the craft and the knowledge that is inherent in craftsmanship and making mostly learned from generation to generation into our time it makes their objects evident and intense at the same time their work is an ecological statement, not by the reflection they set up on ecology, 
but by the fact that they make it happen. So I'm very pleased to welcome in the going public Aljuna Shimento and Kati Sterczyk from the Home Project. Obrigada. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we, I was uh, about to, to start our video already before we were here laughing and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, very pleased for this uh, introduction. Um, first of all, thank you for this invitation, uh, the formal part. We are very, really happy to um, have this moment of reflection on our work and very thanks for this uh, resume of our work and in fact you know our practice already since quite quite some time <laughs> travel with us so we have to share the the screen, share the screen. Um, so we prepared um, a presentation in which um, we want to show a bit the purpose of our uh, of our practice and you would like to start with the title why invent what's already been invented? We chose this because it's a saying that um, guides us and follows us almost in our practice since the very beginning. So why should we design something new? And how does this new thing or this new product or this new idea um, actually relate what is there already? This is a bit what, what guides us. And before we now going to show up our, um, our work, we really want you to take on a journey and um, shows the start of all of our work, which starts with a very deep observation of, um, of uh, people in place. So we look um, before we start the design process in uh, the landscape, we try to understand why things are like they are and how, how humans uh, sometimes funnily uh, try to, uh, to appropriate uh, certain things. This can be this kind of uh, misfits almost, but it can be also material culture. And the material culture, of course, differs a lot um, through identity, through a region, um, in a city. And what triggers us here is always the layers that we can find and uh, how they are placed. Um, you will see now uh, in the next, in, during the next 45 minutes that we narrowed our work and uh, what we're gonna show a bit on the south part and the central part of Portugal. So uh, we will stay a bit in the same uh, cultural identity. Um, another fact that we've always, or that we are always looking for is uh, beyond this beauty of a beautiful white wall and uh, somehow a, a southern hemisphere, we look at these objects that you see here as some misfits. You know, the, all these products are already used and adapted to a speci special purpose and um, therefore sometimes, well, create, uh, uh, create this kind of disturbances. And sometimes it's almost ugly. So how are uh, here these this water vessels that uh, usually would be um, made in, in traditional materials like clay and how the synthetic um, uh, yeah, new interpretations do not integrate at all in the surroundings. And sometimes there's some spontaneous beauty that comes when, um, when you look how nature is appropriated and uh, used for a specific purpose. I think this resumes it a bit. And then, of course, due to this uh, observations we always end again and again with the crafts <laughs> and yeah that's how we arrived to the crafts uh, so we didn't start there but um, we found out that this was would be probably the best way to produce something the most logical way to make things where there is in the traditional crafts especially we identified this direct relation of men people with the natural resources. So it was kind of dialogue with, with the environment. This was what called our attention. So uh, we arrived there right? so when, while we were looking for this, a way out of what, of what we study and what we, we, we saw in the design sector uh, by then. So we wanted to draw our own path and we, 
while looking, we, we arrived to those things and this brought us to, to the main questions. It was also clear how the crafts can evolve. So um, this manual making had um, all the mechanisms of innovation. Um, and when we see things um, like the ones we are showing you now, it became clear for us um, that we had to pose questions. So what is what really improved? What happened? So we changed from things that are made by the hands for the hands that have tangible relation with the body, um, that have expression, that have uh, are ecologically efficient, to things that don't quite have an identity or personality, um, that don't have a story but somehow uh, reply to factors that are intangible for us that we cannot uh, reach. Um, and it was this confront between what is the vernacular knowledge and what is this industrial mass industry production that really triggers uh, what was lost, what can, can improve. And this is um, the two, let's say, poles, no? because there is a, a, a constant tension in our work. If we can talk about these two poles that somehow are always present and guide us, it's the, the relation between origin and scale. Um, if we can resume it and press it in this way. For us, origin is, is place, no? is the generous lochi, is the raw matter, is the permanence in a place. Um, and is a source for thought. We should question this. Now, for us, it's where we get the, the real interpretation of things. Scale is movement, dialogue, relations, is a transformation. So everything that happens is the interpretation. So scale can move, it's dynamic. Um, and this relation between what is natural landscape and what is the presence and the work of the people that interpret, work with it, uh, do things with it, create their own material culture. Um, that in the crafts, we find balance there because there's only so much you can do. There's only so much that a man can do with work. There's only so much that it will impact uh, not only in the environment, but also culturally. So it's kind of, um, the, craft, the traditional crafts have a natural balance towards the environment. I won't say nature because we all live inside nature, so I uh, won't split this uh, man and nature. And um, yeah, for us, um, so design starts as a learning process. And as designers, we have this intention of framing works, organizing information, learning fast. And so we also understood that when you remove, um, even when you remove a decoration from a vessel to make it more uh, easy reproducible, you are removing information, you are removing visual codes, so you are removing some effect of culture. Um, and this was the challenge, how do we somehow incorporate what is the design skills and things, synthesizing in the end without losing anything. So in product, that's, that's, that was, is still a big challenge. So we'll start now by presenting some projects where we can then build a story around what we're telling. Um, this project, Cultura Intensiva, Intensive Culture, we did in, in the south of Portugal, in the Algarve, like most of the things we'll talk today. Um, Cultura Intensiva was about not to look for shapes, not to learn from crafts, but to look at a specific cultural identity, a specific way of making, and looking at how people do things, how do they solve their everyday, how do they build tools, how do they uh, make by, um, and transform this into like a design brief. So this would be the assignment to look and to continue to develop that way of making into things. So we would look around at the resources and these people, for example, I'll show you a few examples, they, they recycle a lot. So it's uh, materials, uh, special materials are not available. This is inland. So they have this culture of always 
um, reviewing things and getting another sense, always making the best of what they have. And this for us was also some kind of envisioning. It's, it's, it's like a, a tool for creativity. When you look at a, a bottle and you say that can be a container for something else. So only using what we found um, and looking at was also, so not placing these things in another context. So we also looked at um, what, what would they need, what they need for. No? So these people preserve a lot, um, but also the thing of uh, aesthetics. No? So uh, you have a lot of fresh fruits, you have fresh flowers at the table. And we would make also this provocation of saying, why don't you have dry fruits? Why don't you have dry flowers? And produce an object that would have more modern lines and it would be made specially to integrate what is uh, sometimes despised in its own context. Also making some kind of um, assignments where we would change uh, shapes. Uh, when, when a handle of a, a clay pot is broken, a uh, texture in, is built around it to, to replace the handle and to make other shapes. So we would change different shapes and make uh, kind of problems, design problems for different craftsmen for them to come out with different aesthetics, different handles, different patterns. But the one that you see here, if you see only at the, the mouth, the, the top part, even after you lose everything, the handles, the body, everything, maybe you can still do something with it. So this, this was a one month um, kind of experimental um, project. And uh, we tried to, yeah, to show how it is possible to, 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 to bring like a, a special local identity to continue and to produce more uh, material culture, but also humor, you know, sarcasm, humor, irony, that's also part of local culture. So we played with these plates this, that have sayings that are in every house. And because it's a very touristic area, instead of saying a swallow doesn't make a spring, we would say like a tourist doesn't make a summer or life is hard for do who doesn't have internet. So also bring it to more contemporary, force it into a contemporary um, context. In this year, we have to make a new one, but we still don't know which one. <laughs> which will be the same. But <laughs> yeah, also, it's very important for us to give back the and and to kind of as an action of celebration to to exhibit or to share what was what were our findings and our work. So we made an exhibition and then later in the Design Biennale in Lisbon, um, where there would be discussions and we would present all this. Um, all these results of this experiment to create also discussion about this. Why are we using this globalized um, flat um, things where we can actually, with what is in one place, bring it further um, and fulfill the needs that we have in everyday uh, contemporary art. We also documented this and invited more people to do the reflection, um, a, a chef cook, um, photographer, Edward Bell, very renowned photographer for landscape um, um, photography, and uh, researchers um, that helped us reflect on this and produced this book to somehow also uh, establish this, this kind of way of, of thinking and reflecting about local culture. Another small project we put, we thought it would be interesting to explain this, this way of thinking. Um, the uh, Experimental Biennale in Lisbon um, invited us for an exhibition was called Timeless. And the assignment was they would give, uh, or each designer would uh, choose one uh, traditional object and would make an interpretation of it. We uh, chose three and what we tried to do was again to make a provoke discussion about the this um, overlapping of different worlds um, in our lives. So we chose one very industrial product, plastic. Um, this, this cutting board is it's kind of an icon. Uh, it's from a 50s brand, um, Faplana, and it's kind of present uh, all over uh, Portuguese kitchens. And what we did was we, we kind of 
change the material. So to put this question, why is this useful, well-made product fails in one point? Why did it become trash? You know, why doesn't it respond fully to, a, to, to its function and also respects the environment? The second object was in the middle. So it was a semi-industrial object, which is this oven toasters. They are still used. They're very cheap, but after a few, a few days, they get black and rusty. And uh, there is no reason for this. Um, and also they're square. We don't have squared breads in Porto, um, but these are made here. So we kind of changed the shape. We fixed it. We gave it an NML um, coating and used also uh, inox so it doesn't rust. <laughs> and even as provocation, uh, made a very uh, kitsch uh, traditional between brackets uh, decoration to say this is now a more traditional product. Uh, so if you assume it as traditional, it should somehow develop on the direction of what is your bread, how you use it, and also be lasting in quality. Craft things don't have to be low quality. The last one was this um, olive plate, which is still widely used, but it resists uh, improvement, so it breaks easily. It doesn't uh, staple in restaurants, is always a disgrace. Um, so it somehow didn't change. It's resistant to change. So you can see here on the right, um, you're already in the exhibition, we made a plastic version. So we, we switch it with the other end of the, of the product, our selection, and made this uh, very fine, uh, more resistant, um, a stackable uh, version to give this comment. So what we, we wanted to do here is in the end um, make a statement as on both ends of, of, um, of uh, products, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to be said and to be improved. So with these three products, we didn't really invent anything. We didn't brought any ideas besides a, a revision and improvement to reflect about them. And there's so much to do uh, like this. So it was also a statement um, against what, what we saw as this uh, distant um, uh, designer fair uh, magazine design in a way. Well, and this, this uh, self-initiated or more the uh, self-initiated um, project, <clears throat> we caught the interest um, from more, yeah, from clients from outside. In this case, it was a family and um, architect um, from the Algarve in southern Portugal. They were planning on the land of their family of the grandparents. Uh, to build a house that would cite somehow um, the memories of, of their family and, uh, and also of the, of the traditional cultures from that region. And for us, um, I mean, since we are here in an architectural <laughs> faculty mainly, it's also good here to see it. Just, uh, the interpretation of this house was really uh, trying the best, to take the best out of uh, the, the amazing location in which this house is in Oliao. So you have the sea view, so there are two um, blocks of, of houses that are um, all equipped with uh, terraces, so uh, that the guests of this boutique hotel with, uh, with nine rooms um, can um, enjoy the view and, and the stay. And uh, our brief was to, from the beginning, it was, this was the, the very uh, the luxury for us and uh, we got invited <clears throat> to to see the old house before they start the entire um, project to look into the memories of the grandparents we were uh, we could pick out or pick some of the uh, the elements that we would use directly in decoration of um, of the interiors but also some of the the um, the furnitures that we could use um, to, to cite from, that we, we could uh, build new interpretations. And this resulted in, um, on one hand, in some um, tableware and uh, decorative items for the rooms and for the, for the public uh, rooms, in which we um, used, uh, well, 
uh, traditional techniques um, and some new interpretations with local producers. So we work with a, with a potter to make some, um, some water, um, uh, water jars for each room and uh, for the breakfast room also certain things. And then <clears throat> one of the bigger uh, interventions there was uh, was uh, the brief to to create some versatile furniture, a set that would um, be um, distributed in each of the rooms and that would fulfill um, the purpose that each client and guest can use it wherever they want. Um, what we did here is really we we translated the um, the findings we, we found from the from the grandparents into um, a wooden bench, into a cork stool, and in another table um, in uh, metal and and wood. And what happens uh, along the days and along the years by now is that the people really uh, use this indoor and outdoor in whatever they wherever they need it. They uh, they can take it with them and uh, and work with it. Here's again the cork stool. And then in, um, the third block in this um, uh, interior design uh, intervention was uh, the lightning um, elements. And for the public room in this case, which is a community kitchen with the old oven, um, we used the, the old, um, or like a, a cork, the black cork. Uh, that is also burnt and um, want, yeah, wanted to create this kind of um, contrast here. And in the rooms, uh, we went back to natural, uh, na natural cork, as you call it. It's an agglomerate, but uh, you call it uh, in this because of the color. And it's a simple, very thin uh, brass uh, fittings where we then play with cork and, and try to adapt it to, to the needs over there. Here, for instance, this one that can bend and swing in front of the window and uh, it's really in front of the sea view. So we try to, to do something playful here. And this was for us an, uh, an amazing project um, to translate for the first time uh, this vernacular research and uh, this, this, this memories and this, this new interpretations into a minimalistic uh, contemporary uh, interior. And uh, it was a very nice collaboration that uh, still continues a bit. So I think this is the first block, and now we come to the second that yeah. you were supposed to say. <laughs> yeah, the, another part um, that uh, of our work was um, when we start to be um, asked by by um, public institutions to think in territory, so um, strategic regional development. So we started with this with this own path of of looking for what would be vernacular culture and products and how we can translate this into interiors, how to can this way of making things can be useful to improve everyday life. And then um, so institutions start coming to us to, to apply this to a wider scale. And this, this for us was, was a big change. Suddenly we were not focusing like this, you know, in a cone, like we had to open up and think how are things in a relation? How do things, what are the dynam social dynamics in the, in the territory? So that's why we put this phrase of implicating without imposing is we have to implicate everything, call all the actors into, a, into the game, bring them into the issues, bring into the problems and um, build a kind of a, a platform system where everybody has something to say and um, Everybody is is at stake, understands as a stakeholder, and at the same time um, is transparent and um, horizontal. So we have the best um, the best results for for everybody in the sense for the communities. Um, we worked in um, two years in for the government of Catalonia, um, doing exactly that in two communities, uh, two com uh, three actually, two of black clay, um, and one with um, rock, salt rock, um, making products and also working with the craftsmen how to improve production. And even in one of them, we finished with, with uh, two policies um, that would then um, bring different kinds of funding for the, for the craftsmen to improve their, their, um, 
their activities. And there it became really interesting because you're not thinking about material anymore only. You're not thinking about aesthetics. You're not thinking how to make a statement about the usefulness of these things. Suddenly we are thinking about uh, societies, the history of places. How does this impact also economically the, the life of people? Um, we will show you this project, Pred Tarzan, we did in Galgarv also to stay in the same place. Um, as an example of this kind of projects that we did. So this was a project on the regional um, government. Um, one year project, we did this full time, full on, and really hands on. So we really went uh, first to the craftsmen to, to understand how they worked, what were the problems, what were the advantages, how was their, their activities, what kind of skills did we find, how were they less representatives? How, how much people we still have working? And especially, sorry, the names are in Portuguese, but this is, this is craft work. So you have in English on top. So we looked at the craft, as, at the craft uh, activities as, as, as sources and resources, but we also thought how we could connect them. So the first thing was to understand what does this region has to offer, okay? but they also could trade between them. Then we added a second layer um, and we start talking with, with the public sector, the um, tourism institutions, but also the culture institutions, uh, municipalities, private, the entities. private entities, the, the hotelry, very strong in the region, but even with event managers. So we would talk with the gallery and with the shop, um, we wanted to understand what was also the demand. So basically we, we had this kind of catalog characterized what this region had to offer as its skills, competences, uh, material and, and uh, human resources. And then we would see what the market is asking. And then we, would, we were always asking both where would they link and where not? And why wasn't this regional market really using or uh, addressing the crafts um, so well? or what would be needed. We added another layer, which was about patrimony. So um, museums, um, uh, research centers, we had seven researchers working with us, and also education. The University of Algarve also was involved, and we called also some education centers and even uh, high schools. So we would bring the young people also into this we brought them in, in trips, we show them what was there. We, we wanted to understand how also we could place these things in, in their context, in their eyes, eye uh, height, but in a natural way without making it cool or sexy, you know, that this, it came up naturally. So we involved them in the process also. And this is what happened. So the connections you see here are real connections, but we wouldn't go now for each product or each service that we created, joined each, each partner, this would take more time than we have. Um, but we'll show a few examples of products and let you know how the dynamics were, were happening. But what, what we did actually in practical was we first got these orders, the requests, and we only started creating, developing products and services directly for a request that we identified, which was more uh, concrete or less concrete uh, proposition. And we started, we involved everybody. The researchers were there. Most of them didn't even uh, knew the, the area, the, the craftsmen so well. And we involved everybody like hands-on. Um, they would, uh, these researchers would inform a lot what we were doing, also understand the relation, the context of that it had the, the historical relation also with the, with the region. Um, and the artisans were the center because they somehow they materialized all this knowledge and all this stuff. They make this, this uh, um, endemic sense of, of crafts, they make it real, they make it visible. So we started through this work to produce, we made a collection of 26 um, products and services that uh, from several um, price ranges and for several sectors. We'll show you a few examples. Uh, we also did this, uh, the work, just an example of how the work would be done. Like what you see here 
and we put this here, we're talking in architecture school. This is a brick factory. There are several there. They collect, there's a special clay in this area that has a very dark tone. And you have a lot of these factories still. These are made hand by hand, one by one in uh, molds. And by hand, they are dried in the sun every day, turned one by one, thousands on the floor. Um, and the kiln is, takes days to fire, takes at least two days to, to make all the structure that the master has to do so that the fire flow, the, the heat flows properly between all this gigantic construction of, of tiles. So this is a really old, old cross, but these people, they, they're they not used to have their things displayed like this. So what happens is that even the people who want to access these products, they, they would have trouble understanding all the quality of the work that would be there. So just the thing of cleaning the house, kind of putting things in order, we might make catalogs, with the graphic design students, they would bring them here. This was not cool for them at the beginning, but then they understood how much they could do. And this was for us also, which is part of our work, like how much can we do and how much can we impact and how can our profession help with something? Um, and from um, visual identities into catalogs, photography, and this, during this process also, the, the, the artisans, they would start to understand the value of what they have you know, in the process itself. And also try to experiment new things to take advantage of this one by one production, which, which is exactly what differentiates this production from in industrial production. You can hear prototype very easily, very quickly, and make things that you don't have to compete with the industry, of course, because this is what's, uh, what's the value of your, of your craft. This is especially is a, is a very interesting item, probably the best example of the, pro, the, the whole project. Uh, one of the municipalities that we worked, 16 of them, um, was actually buying salt fields. So the salt in the Algarve is a very old uh, tradition. Um, and they were buying salt fields because they wanted their project, long-term project was to, to make this Fleur de Sel. I'm sure you know it, it's more French word, the, the international word is usually French. Um, the Fleur de Sel is there, uh, one of the, the best products they have. And they had this long-term project of making this product, this, this salt, um, kind of the identity of their region, use it to promote the region, the quality of their waters, the quality of their product and their cooking and so on. The problem was they were giving tons, they saw we, we gave already tons of salt to the restaurants and to people to promote it, but they simply don't use it. So we went to the, we do the design work, you know, so we go to talk with the people who don't use this beautiful salt at the city, or then they use it, but they use it in the kitchen. So the communication thing, the, the local promotion was not working. Um, and we found out that it was as simple as the normal salt disposers they had in restaurants. The holes were made for refined salt, so they could not put the floor cell inside and it wouldn't work. And if they put it in a plate, it, the, the, the health uh, uh, authorities would, would sue them because this is not hygienic. It, it was a very simple uh, uh, problem to solve. So we basically made this vessel very low cost um, very simple, produced with two different artisans. And right away, the municipality says, okay, we want 2,000 of them. This was the first one, so you don't have, but it had also branded the, the, the brand that came out afterwards of this salt. It still has. Um, it still has. It still has. <laughs> and um, they still use it, yeah, it's 10 years. And um, which was developed, this graphical identity was developed by the students uh, of the, the university. Um, and they still, is still present in the tables of restaurants. And last time we went there, like two years ago, we were asked like, uh, how is it? Uh, do you like to have this? And like, yeah, but it gets stolen a lot. I think it's good. Um, <laughs> another kind of thing, uh, for example, um, uh, this is about the spirit. It's a long, very, very important, very serious tradition in the Algarve, Medronio. Um, it's, uh, very, very strong spirit, more than 50%. It's largely homemade. 
and people take a lot of honor in the quality of this thing. It's kind of a ritual when you finish think, uh, eating together also to have this. And the question was, why, if it's such an honor, if it's such an uh, important ritual, why do you get it at your table in a used plastic bottle or in a secondhand uh, wine bottle? Why doesn't it have a bottle? Or at least it doesn't have to be a, the same bottle for everybody, but at least a more dignified bottle. And we proposed, we made this to design a traditional, again, between brackets, bottle for this. It was kind of the assignment. How do we make a, a bottle that really reflects the, the character of this, of this drink and we replace it for all this plastic and glass? Um, and we put together the, the distillery and uh, the, the potter and to discuss what would be the shape of this. Also, at the same time, again, the brand that you see there, which was missing in the salt disposer, uh, was also designed for this. And they reached to this form, and the, the glazing inside the bottle was in the university to be studied, how it behaved with this kind of alcohol. So it was the whole, in the end, was the whole region was, was working together to, to create its own material culture inside a record, that in a way that would be recognizable for themselves and to show value in, in the existing things. This was very important. Um, just, I think the last example, very simple, but to show also how could we somehow um, provoke this different uh, production improvements. Um, the, the bag in the middle you see, this is the traditional bag. So people, they, this is palm bag. So the, the palm gets uh, dyed uh, before it's woven, and then they make these patterns. And this is probably what the most uh, expand what brings the the, bags, the the price up is this part, this this long lasting part of dyeing and still weaving and get the pattern right. So what we did was we we switch, we we changed the system. So we make all white, which was super easy, and we would dye it afterwards. So this saved a lot of time. And these are the first ones, but with time, they improved in the in, in the in the way of making it, and it start also to to come out patterns in two, three, four colors, and mixing the colors on the right order to make other layers. So it didn't lose the the decoration and the the, the kind of the the, the visual codes uh, that were important for these bags also. Um, the book, besides the product collection. A documentary film we made, you can also see it online, um, was this book we found was very important. This would sustain what we found was a big um, hole in the, in, in, in the development of the culture here, that the materials, local materials were not recognized or valued by the people, um, because that's what we needed. We needed that the, the, the people themselves recognize the value in these things, and didn't look at the crafts or at clay products or as something old, nostalgic, part of par past, uh, rural past, uh, poverty whatsoever. They're they are here today and they're actually much more interesting, uh, be it of price, ecologically interesting, or also to create a circular economy, which is very important. So this book had this function of established this. So we had the seven researchers were contributing to make texts, talking about the this, this skills, the this techniques, the materials, the products that were, the service that were made and contextualizing this uh, in the region. So to kind of establish this is something that somehow makes sense here. This belongs here and it's, this is a richness you know, that has to be somehow, it has the potential to, to continue to, to grow and to, to be part of a, a contemporary language. Um, as uh, Thierry already said in the, the introduction, we, we then, uh, through the, this regional development projects, we, we were invited by the Ministry of Culture to, to make, conceive, um, uh, elaborate a, a national strategy for the art, traditional arts and crafts. We, can, we will not talk about this, but for us, this was, well, it even 
grow even wider no? the, the kind of issues that we have to to deal with to 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 think about a territory nationwide um and think about crafts as a sector um and all the implications that this can have also in the national economy so um you can just briefly say this strategy is about education it's about preservation active preservation so it's not about conservation but it's about working this thing so they don't stay stuck in time it's about um, having a communication um, strategy that shows that these things are more contemporary more relevant than any any other ways of, of production and, and making um, and also of capacitation and when we hear capacitation you think always about giving uh, uh, education to the craft that's what happens here and we said no, no we have we want to capacitate also the consumers because they have to understand what this is and also especially all the creative industry uh, students so prof, um, uh, designers architects everybody who can at some point be um, a, a motor for these things to continue and use them in its um, its own work so this was now put in a pause because of the pandemic situation and the <clears> budget <throat> issues and we are following up the work um, until uh, things are going in a different direction we hope soon um, and back from <laughs> macro to, yeah, to micro <laughs> i mean this uh, reflection we did uh, for this strategy was of course amazing and uh, helped us also to to structure a lot of things uh, and see also a bit the methodology behind our own work uh, in in all of this and um now it's a bit the the last thing we got, we're going to show here is a bit the spa for our <laughs> for our activities uh, we um, continue to apply uh, our our methodology and uh, our our knowledge or to share our knowledge with um, institutions like craft association um, and in the last years we went <clears throat> to the cap Verd islands and also several times to the Azores, uh, to the islands on one hand to to map also their craftsmen but um, especially to make uh, we were invited to um, to do residencies directly with with the craftsmen with the, with groups of craftsmen that um, usually have um, different techniques and different backgrounds and they would um, come together in this uh, in this intense uh, working days where we would discuss and co-create together new interpretations where we would um, talk about what they did until now, what, how they could change things, uh, how, how they could inform their, their designs in different ways or their shapes. And the interesting thing, I think for us is, um, in this um, participatory uh, moments where we all come together is that there is um, a moment where the um, artisans start to exchange themselves and we just have to facilitate uh, this exchange. And it's super rich for all of us um, to see uh, how things are evolving and uh, questions are made, there's space for critics. There's really a podium for for discussion and for experimentation. It's it's all together somehow with uh, the laboratory. And um, here, for instance, you see this with uh, we really push two materials together and try to solve this in the uh, so uh, clay and, and fibers. Sometimes we also just um, give hints to to look into new uh, material um, finishes. How can you look into what you have and uh, use it in a different way? <clears throat> I think this place for itself. Um, and of course, what, what always drives us, uh, and I mean, for them, of course, as well, is, is, uh, is a certain commercial uh, um, aspect in it. So we're trying um, not only to look into um, the cultural heritage, like for instance, here we re reconnected really the, the, the craftsmen with their own heritage and said, look, maybe you can get some patterns, apply them in your own work. Um, so we try to guide this and uh, usually this amazing things happen, uh, like in all workshops, and uh, we try to, um, uh, yeah, to give this space and really to dive into this, uh, uh, this encounters um, because in fact, this is also what informs our work on the macro 
uh, macro yes, yeah. um, layer. It's a moment also for, for exchange. What we try yeah. to make is it's kind of a, a place where they bring all their issues. So they, they we went at, after this, it's always two, three weeks. Um, we make a safe space to, to discuss, to reflect about their own activity, individually, but also collectively. And that they can exchange, share ideas, issues, problems that go from material questions until kind of commercial uh, issues, how to improve communication. So we make kind of a bubble where we can experiment a lot. And our work there is a bit like mediators. Yeah. We, are, we are kind of guiding, orientated a bit the discussion so that each of them takes as much as possible. They also kind of build trust. Just trust is the only thing that gives you courage like to, to, to go ahead and to try out. And that they create bonds so that these people also connect um, so they can improve and they, they can then go back to their workshops and continue in connection, like also builds networking between them a lot. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, in the end of this, of this uh, session, we always make something all together, put everything together, look at it uh, together and try to understand what happened, what can you take from this from shapes to learning to connections, to connections. Um, and this is, is really uh, incredible. It's one of the things that we, this for example is a twisted technique, it shouldn't be made like this, it became uh, beautiful. And we, you would never do this in your workshop when you, because this is a waste of time, <laughs> but it really works. Yeah. This is the crowd from, from Mindelo look up Verde. That and the interesting part for us, and I think this is also one of the biggest outcomes of uh, of our of our work that we usually we keep a handful of, of artisans that are coming back to us, and we continue to work together, and sometimes just to share uh, uh, new uh, new shapes or share ideas or, or things, and this is um, very dignifying uh, in this um, in this approach, and that also keeps us uh, continuing this journey. So to kind of... Uh, oh, are we in time? time? No, we're in time. Ah, yes, we have some. Can do that. Resume. <laughs> uh, resume, or at least make your, <clears throat> you wanted to make a final reflection with you, um, because in the end, I think we can say this, this pandemic situation um, didn't change in our activity much. It kind of put it in perspective for everybody. We don't have to explain so much more what we do and how we want to do things. Um, people want to have things concrete and take hands on, on their own um, reality. And also institutions and their things, understand things differently. Also, these activities, uh, the crafts, whatever you can call it, um, are more, are looked different now. They're looked at actually as, as in economical independence, you know, they're, they're looked as the most um, ecological um, thing you can do as scale. And as you have a lot of practical practice, new practitioners that are starting to get their hands dirty and to do their own uh, um, workshop and to do their own activity, their own things. And it's not so much about shape as it is to change the, the world around you. That's very, very good. Um, so as a conclusion, we would like to say, okay, for design for us, it's, it's about this response. So it always is a, a reaction to something. So we already have something. We already, we already received something. It's a question or it's something we observed. Um, it, it's, it has to be something to which we, we already giving back. Um, yeah? It has to make sense. You, you, can, you have to articulate, the conditions somehow have to be there. Um, and the process, and this is a, a, a reflect this responsibility to be able to respond to this, the process, design process is the construction of this, is how you um, prepare yourself for this response. How do I able, this is a, a thesis from uh, Dora, uh, Donna Hathaway, who says that we, we also, Ailton Krenak, uh, indigenous uh, philosopher, which I really recommend, they have touch points. They say that 
um, for the first time um, and for us activities you know, that project it's interesting they say that the problems are not in the future the problem is now we have to deal with it now the, you cannot solve things that are as outside of you okay this is like man separating from nature you are inside nature there is no such thing as me and nature everything you look around everything you can think of is nature the cosmic is nature so you are inside so you are inside the trouble and now you have to deal with it okay and um, you have to be able to respond to this how do you do that okay it's not it's not like it's not like you have the it's not like a museum or an artwork that has this distance and that comes also for this um, colonial times it comes from the the, uh, the, the arts um, that the museum where things have a distance and they are hard, they are somehow in another degree it, it create everything creates this distance happens somewhere else right now we are inside the trouble uh, and we have to we have to learn how to respond we have to and what we learned also is that this is through the examples we also showed you at what interests us is in how we want to give this response how we how we prepare ourselves is by connecting is by learning is by trying to understand um, where we are and what makes sense that we say because if you you speak from inside out without hearing first it becomes like two monologues and this doesn't make sense and the things then we are building ruptures you know it's a bit like it's a bit like fashion uh, every six months they tell you that what they sold you six months ago is rubbish it doesn't matter anymore so it's kind of um, it's like the, the theory of innovation it's not evolution it's innovation so it's kind of it it uh, it evolves by rupture, by breaking, by saying that the past doesn't matter. The cross, for example, are totally the opposite. It says that you have to continue. It's a long path, and you have, in the end, um, to yeah to have a co-responsible design. It, it's all the everything you do has an impact on something or others, and so resuming this, I think. Uh, what we are interested in, not in innovation or fast growth, but in something that has roof, roots and that makes sense in, I mean, it is, it's, it's a, the continuation, the evaluation, if you want to say evolution, or if you want to say uh, innovation has to be something um, reasonable, um, has to be something consequent. And it's, so that it's co-responsible. So we are all in it together. I think this is something, if there is something good <laughs> of this situation we are all living now, is that we are all living it, okay? And it's not attacking anybody else, only us. So there is a message in it. And um, so the response is to be shared also. Um, yeah, just as a final and saying question. that, and saying that. Yeah. And also reflecting again on this last month, um, we uh, decided to dedicate a place um, to this research and development that we showed you now in the last uh, 50 minutes. And uh, we started and um, decided to, um, to start a new platform, which is called uh, Origin Kumu, which is uh, Common Origins. Um, it's a website. It's an association and uh, it is um, a platform to preserve the traditional craft through research and uh, also through residencies, to, through documentations where we, where we dedicate just a bit more space and more time to it. And last, and this is for us very important as well, um, it will have a shop to create access to these beautiful pieces um, that sometimes are very difficult. To, to get. So stay tuned, uh, please. <laughs> we want to spread the word. And uh, yeah, and looking forward to the next steps. That's yeah, it. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Yeah, merci. <laughs> now I have to take off the sharing, right? Yeah, great. Thank you. Where did you learn, thank you, Val, from Cherry?
Jerry? Don't hear. No, no. Kati is perfectly uh, not by three language. I don't know how many languages she speaks, but also Dutch. Oh, yeah. Noch een beetje. Niet meer zoveel, maar nog een beetje. Great. Thank you so much. It was uh, fantastic. Uh, Jay, maybe we start first with two over time questions uh, that were prepared by uh, students uh, hey so everyone can hear me yeah. ah, perfect uh, yeah very interesting also um that that you act uh, very much as a mediator between the craftsmanship and then the consumer and see how you can also uh, improve this that was very uh, yeah i didn't see it it goes beyond um and now for my question, uh, I was wondering, um, when uh, did you realize that um, maybe as a student that you wanted to um, fulfill this role in architecture and design? Since the very beginning. <laughs> ah. of our, of our, I mean, I think at least I can say this, we didn't study together, but I had the first crisis and the biggest crisis during university where I said, uh, why should I do things? Why should I um, design? And what's my position? And um, it was a search. I was always looking for this human factor, for this human uh, approach, for a communication, for a dialogue. Um, like almost without the idea of uh, craft. I mean, as, as we said, crafts was comes in a bit later because it's. Um, um, it's a good method. You know? It's a, a result on this. But for me, it was a, was really a, a necessity from the beginning uh, to create, um, um, yeah, a need for. I, di I didn't have to do another chair. I had to have a reason for doing a new chair. <laughs> more stuff. Yeah, yeah a lot of stuff, stuff yeah. going on. I mean, you open so, a magazine. Even the our kiosk guy here in the in the corner the other day, I was opening a magazine and he pointed out and said, "Ah, that picture is also on the other magazine." And I opened and showed me. It was all the same. Magazines are catalogs. And why would you want to make more stuff? Why is about? Um, I mean, I think in architecture is a bit different because you always work on prototypes. You always make one piece. Right? In the end, yeah. somebody told once. You always work on the ruins <laughs> because you're always always old after you you make it but um, in industrial design you the things explode i mean you can make uh, something that gets reproduced by the hundreds of thousands and so you with this kind of scale you have to reflect very well about what are you making you know so and why would you just make another chair? I mean, when, you know, it's like the, the, the Indian saying, right? the, the last fish is gone and the last tree is dead. Uh, I sit and turn on the light. That's what people in the design fairs are saying. Is that it? I don't know. But there's, what well, I think what I felt personally was that the skills that I got uh, could do something else. I remember a student saying this in one of the workshops we did. We did also some pro social pro design projects in Berlin when we lived there. And one student said something like, I asked what, so what do you want to do? And she says, I, I studied design, but now I want to do something good. <laughs> this was very clear. Uh, yeah, because you really learn to, 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 yeah, how to get into the cover of the magazine. Is that really, I don't know. It was kind of weird, weird times. And you, you feel you have, you have skills and you have tools. You know how to learn fast. You know how to systemize the knowledge. There, this is interesting tools. They are can be well used. Um, doesn't have to be for that small purpose of making furniture. I mean, there's so many weapons or whatever you have to do. Can be something good. There's a lot of ethics to discuss on design. But but I think it's also important to say that um, I'm. Mean, it's, it's, it's an act of conscience. Sorry. Yeah, and I think what happened in uh, in, uh, in our both the cases, or that, but also probably finds or where the, our relation starts uh, in the in the professional practice is that we um, 
we both didn't look for a methodology to apply. We just went. We had a stomach feeling and said, look, there has to be something else. There was curiosity to apply the humble tools we had uh, to, to something. And only over this years now, after all this, we can, we can talk very clearly about what really happens and we can, we, um, we have names no, to, to, uh, to define what we're actually doing. But it was always a very um, innocent um, research in the, end, in the beginning. Well, yeah. you said it. I, said I finished it. school, I went back home to the Algarve and just closed myself at home. <laughs> Kathy said we should do something with what we know. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah, here we are. But, yeah. I hope we yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you already for that answer. <laughs> so something new, I'm also. Hey, Michelle next, uh, and then maybe. Yeah, like um, I'm really impressed about uh, the work about craft craftsmanship. It's really impressive to work with local and involve even new generations in that, I guess, as you did uh, in your daily trip, like in the trip that you've done. So I would like maybe to understand how you can deal with technologies that are taking over and if you integrate maybe technology with craftsmanship in some way, let's say, especially for new generation that has always like taking into, into consideration more technologies than something more local? Well, crafts, they also have technology, you know? It's not high-end technology. I, if you think about this, uh, the, the things that we use now, um, um, all this high-end uh, cell phones and all these things, if you like, Somebody said, if you put uh, the evolution of humanity fast forward, compress it to one hour, you probably have computers in the last seconds, you know? So it's not that important. Um, we can relate in other, other ways and we have to, lo to look at, for example, we, when we are making this, let's talk about products. When you are making these things, we don't, we, we say we're not gonna use laser cutting or 3D, we're not going to use it, but we always make the things. Um, it, it's not. This is not a, a prejudice. Um, it's just to say that it's not that important. It's there are tools. The only thing that is improving are the tools for us to visualize things faster. This has a very negative impact on creativity. Just shut off your phone and spend one week with a basket weaver that also doesn't have a phone. And you will understand this. There will be a moment where you go into a trance <laughs> of looking at all these circles, and then, and then you get it. That time is very valuable. And then you will start also like the craftsmen, they have this. You arrive there with the drawing, and you say, can you make me this? And he looked and said, uh-uh, no. Because it really takes time, you know. He will take a whole day. Why would he spend this day doing that? And why are you? Why? Why? Why, why would he? And this is good. Why? Yeah, exactly. Why? It has to be really good and useful, or somebody has to need it before he dies. It has to be something that is really necessary. So you have to. Convince. In order to change his techniques, for instance. Yeah, or to. Why? Why should he do something that he doesn't do already? Like. Why? No, or also making something like different. Is that, Make that me this and that shit. Mm -hmm. Once I show the 3D. Uh, ceramic piece <laughs> to a, a, a potter friend and uh, to Francisco, and he said, "Ah, now nah, why don't you ask uh, ask the person who made you that one?" <laughs> and I was, <laughs> "Yeah, I made this. We cannot drink from the computer. I really need you to do this." But it really takes, they have to sit, they have to prepare, it takes time, you know, they have to look at it, make three or four because before it's correct. So then you really have time. If you make your thing in the computer and you send it somewhere and it gets done and it gets back to you, you don't feel the responsibility, you don't have any investment. If you don't have anything to lose, if you don't have an investment, so things become somehow invisible to you. It's kind of the trash, the trash goes, you don't care. But if it would be dumped your trash at your door every day, you would be still, you, you, you would start like thinking about how much you, 
you do, you know? It's a bit, they have this every time because they look at it and say, this is gonna take me four hours. Do I really wanna do it? You know, so just to answer about technologies, yeah, they, I think communication can be a very good thing with the new technologies, can help a lot to diffuse knowledge, to document knowledge. Uh, mass data is very important to understand also the, the, what is going on and uh, how, for example, knowledge can be applied or is changing or is being lost. Um, but besides that, on the actual um, material, practical uh, design um, thing, uh, I don't miss it at all, this new technology. Although we use it, huh? we, we have things. Uh, but it's more on the communication, I think, that can really help. You know? it, can, it can make something to, to somehow preserve knowledge or, or help communication. Yeah. And I think on the other side, what uh, we are now um, talking about a lot in, uh, lately is also if you, I mean, if you look into resources like waste, like alders, um, different materials that still, I mean, in recycling, it has been done, plastic that is recycled in, in weavings all over the world. But if you go a bit further and you see um, of how you can um, integrate new, mate new materials, natural materials, waste materials, unused materials until now and combine this with old techniques. This is in fact what uh, a lot in, um, in, in design laboratories already happen, but always without the information of from old crafts. Um, I think there, there be, there's an interesting field of innovation that, that can happen. So like if you look into um, the fact that the clay uh, um, is um, the clay resources are going down. So how can we use another waste material in order to turn it really maybe with the craftsman instead of reproducing it with a 3D machine? I mean, there are, there are connections, I think, where it's interesting to interfere, but we, and I'm curious to do this in the, in the next uh, years until now we didn't do this, but I think there's a lot. Um, it's always in the, a bit, as I before said, it's not disruptive. It should always go and grow together. That I think is much more uh, um, sustainable for for everybody. For appropriation also of an idea that it doesn't stay in the laboratory, but that it really makes it into um, into the consume into the usage of the everyday. Yeah, and this is also part of the answer from before from Mike that about how you. We also, you remind me this, because what, what we took this path, also because we wanted to have the impact, you know, when you're in school, you are told, okay, you can apply this design to a competition or to a brand that then will, and then this takes several years until somebody can grab the fork that you made through this chain. We wanted to get things out there. I want, I want to eat with this fork next week or tomorrow. I want that people can use this directly. So we also found a yeah. more direct way to get things done and to, to, yeah, to, to get them out, to, to see how they work, to, to have impact. <laughs> Sorry, if I... Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it is a, a very uh, direct <laughs> impact that you have. And uh, I find this, this uh, very valuable and it also makes me think of uh, is there maybe a revamp of uh, craftsmanship then in a way and then could we see yeah it would be nice to see this not only in portugal um, but it really is also uh, stimulating local economies uh, yeah providing jobs putting people on a map and not that this is what is uh, made for that to to hype something but i think it's very valuable to uh, uh to create also then this platform and interact with them and see what you can do on their level uh and their workshop how they present stuff uh yeah uh, it makes me wonder not... what would happen if you were in another country as well with with different arts and crafts uh, again or crafts yeah yeah but it's, i think i mean there are a lot of uh initiatives and uh, this kind of empowerment stuff and, and all this that already happened. I just would like to tell, which I didn't say in this Taza project, in the Algarve, for instance, 
the biggest success for us is that it's, this project is still running. And there are, I mean, we are not um, uh, in charge or we're not related anymore, but um, it's carried on by, um, by another entity. And they, um, last year we did a workshop on basketry and one of the women who was teaching other students uh, the palm weaving was, um, um, was, it, was a student that learned in the TASA project. So this means that this, this whole, the, in the moment, when you see that your work that you were thinking of is now That's the baby crazy. is uh, is is uh, starting to walk on itself and it starts to have uh, different ways, but it grows. This is amazing, and I think that it's not something that happens only in Portugal. There are other countries which still have a um, this rural crafts and uh, an active dynamic scene where this kind of interventions are growing now. It's, uh, there's some kind. It's not a job. It's kind of a, it's kind of a life choice. I mean, if you just think uh, all the things you have, you know, all this technology and uh, the, the chances you have, or all that you have to do in a city, why would you sit somewhere to make a basket, or to make uh, things that take so long that are exactly the same for ten thousand years? They're exactly the same. We still have shapes that are still repeated. Why are these people insisting there's a resilience of making again and again and again the same thing in the same way while the world around gets faster and crazy and whatever, and they stand there and still do the same shape for the same purpose, the clay bottle, they do it like this. Why, why this? There's some kind of a poetry in this. There's something there they're not crazy. <laughs> it's something that we should be aware. It's a bit like the the this this author that I really recommend, Ailton Krenak. Soon I think you can you can read it also in, in English. Um, he was saying they ask, are you not afraid of the extension of the the, the, the tribes, your tribe and the other tribes in the there in Brazil in Amazon? And he us? No, we are resisting for 500 years since you came. I'm worried about you. How will you resist? We are resisting. We know that we, we won't disappear. We, you know, it's a bit like the cross. And it's like, ah, oh, it's going to end. Why? The guy is there doing the same. I mean, the, the black pottery, we have pieces with 10,000 years. Well, who is afraid that this thing disappears now suddenly from one day to the other? But probably the you know, like other technologies already changed. Soon you don't find a, a, a gasoline car, but the guy is still making the pot, the clay pot. So there's some kind of thing here. Resilience. Resilience kind of, you know, that's, yeah, we're not, I'm not afraid that the techniques disappear. I mean, but we also still potatoes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Eva, Eva the monk has a question for you. Eva? Please. Yes, hi. Um, my question relates a bit back to um, the growth you were talking about earlier, I guess. So um, I was wondering, there was kind of a shift in scale between the first and the second part of the project that you showed from more the micro to the macro scale, as you called it. Um, and in the way you were talking about it, this transition felt very fluid and also like a very logical next step. Um, but I'm very curious to know um, if, if there were some challenges you faced during this upscaling or if you would say that um, each scale of projects has its own kind of challenges and that they are just different and not smaller or bigger. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious about your process behind it. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah it, it's like it's a different country, but you are the same person. No? So if you stick to what you think it's true, so it all works. For it was, a, we had to rethink a lot of things, but in the core, we just stayed with this trying to be reasonable, not to force things which would not make sense um, or keep it non nonsense like. A, Thierry said in the beginning, it's um, if you make it coherent, consequent, reasonable, 
keep everybody at the table. Um, it, yeah, it's some, it, I, what I felt was that somehow it didn't depend on both of us uh, anymore so much. We had to consider that there would be other players. And I think the big decision was when we, well, in our way of working, we would have to sit everybody with equal power uh, in the sense, like we say, implicate, kind of bring people, find ways that people would be stuck to the story and couldn't leave. And, and, um, and then you have to go with it, you know, you always, you have to listen, you have to, to find ways to keep people interested. You cannot just build expectations that are false. Everything has to be very real, you cannot fail. And I think the most important thing that we, or maybe the most difficult part was to build the same kind of trust and to, to somehow connect the different people on different parts of the hierarchy and the different institutions. The institutions were the most hard because um, people don't move from their air condition. Um, it's, it's difficult, you know, they, they, they are doing tasks. Um, it, and it was, we had, we always had to advance by example. And when we got to make the, this units of work groups and then put it all together, I think in Taza, we, people only understood already like after 11 months of project. Like it was, we were doing everything. We were talking with one, saying this, go talk with the other one, he said this. And 16 municipalities with several departments, museums, companies, everything. So in the end, you kind of unveil, you know, because the researchers see that comes out a product has his text on the, on the label. And we say the other one said this, and we are going to do this there. And you start kind of pushing them all together. Um, and there were people saying, I heard so many times the phrase, oh, you really did it. Like, what did you expect? That somebody enters your office, says, I'm going to make a party, and then goes home. Of course, we, we um, people are so not expecting uh, that some of the projects will go ahead. I think the institutional part was very hard and breaking the boundaries between several, um, how do you call this, like the, the regional local prejudices between um, institutions also. You know, this university does not connect with that kind of institution, the tourism. But what was interesting is, again, the products were kind of the binding glue because in one product, we would call this person, we would call this research, not even, no, we're not the craftsman or the skills, it was the products themselves. Because you said you work in, you're a director of this institution and you said you needed this, so you are responsible. You said we put people to work and the other one contributed here and the other one is called like this and the students are here. So it was very democratic. The product was not, it's good because it doesn't talk, so it doesn't complain, is at the center. And everybody's kind of gravitating around this. And when they know, they are contributing to the same thing. And this is a very, um, un it's a way to work without problems, you know, because if when you know, you already contributed to the same thing that the other person contributed. So you already started the dialogue without even talking. And that's the way that we found to put people in contact and reveal in a practical manner that they can collaborate and they can produce beautiful things, useful things for the region, also services, if they put their minds together. But we couldn't tell this from the beginning. It was, I think this was kind of the key to, it was also a design problem. We had to design the product. It's the same, uh, I mean, so it's the same. I do not so much uh, involved in the next, in the millimeter of a corner on an angle, it's more, <laughs> Yeah. The no, the tone, how you talk with one and uh, connected with the other. In, in fact, it's, oh, it's yeah, the same, it very same, same, but different. You hear, <laughs> but, yeah. you hear the same people saying the same things. Yeah. 
in three different cities from three different oh. totally social classes. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I hope I it's, it's really, it. really beautiful how it connects so many people through one object or one process. So it's a really beautiful thing you're doing. Thank you. Um, I'll be and Kathy, before I, I have two questions, but there is a, a small question in the Q and A about: Did you do research in the Basque country? No, or only did, you know, but not yet. Did you do not yet? Well, and then this is a, a, a perfect one to come to my question, because um, what I see is that you you um, you have found a way. A kind of method to uh, to facilitate in a very um, uh, intriguing way and indeed to bring people together. So th there is something here happening that is probably also interesting, not only in Portugal but also in other countries. Yeah. Um, is there, um, in one or another way, and um, is that a, a mission, a goal for you to to maybe uh, consolidate this in um, in text material handbook thing, something like that so that it can be useful also in other places the doctor thesis <laughs> ah yeah but albio i ask for you <laughs> don't start don't 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 cheat with me eh? <laughs> yeah I, I i think so i mean we worked already in several places yeah. I think this is um, well. Yeah, to me, it's ob it's obvious that um, there is that potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's okay. A, it, so it is a format. Yeah, you can say it's a format. It's very open format. It's there. There is a. I cannot remember now. Yeah. Well, and then it's an open format, but maybe it's also uh, culturally. Um, Maybe we have to take care of in in what kind of culture you you bring it. So maybe there are differences. You have the language. Uh, you both can can speak with the local people. The moment you go to another place, you will need other facilitators, of course. And so it's not something you have. I think at a certain moment there is a moment of transferability of your uh, methods, ways of working, so that it can become a kind of tool also in other settings. Yeah, of course. But you always That's need where we, native, yeah. native, uh, uh, natives with you to, to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this is a big difference. Okay. And so I fluidly come to my second question, and that is um, can we organize a summer school next summer for oh. students of our institute? To Wait. come here or we come there? Yeah, no, no, we come to you. Oh, yeah, great. Of yeah, we are really one with this project origin Comune. We are recording. We are recording, and eh? so ah. it's on tape. Eh? Well, with this project, let's, let's with, do uh, it. with origin Comune, and also I use your last question to reply. Also, <laughs> um, we want to do this, and but I was thinking what you said about the the, the frontiers, not like language is the last frontier. <laughs> then it starts, but I think there is some things that break the ice. Uh, we also we did a workshop in China. This was that's that's another talk. Um, but when <laughs> I think there's some things that break the ice, and since when you when you say that you don't want to do anything, like if you make a if you make a workshop with designers and you say we're not gonna do any new objects, you right away put a you know it's a cold water uh, on it. And then when everybody's kind of slow down, then everybody's on the same, and then you can talk. So in China it was a bit the same. We first had to say no, no, let, don't rush. No shapes. Let's, let's first no shapes, no product mindset. Let's first talk. And suddenly when people like slow down and you get everybody into the same frequency, um, then it's a bit like the project in the center. I cut, the cultural issues are put aside, you know. There are more important things in the table. We are working on, we are looking at all at the same thing, not at each other anymore. So the differences become rich, become things that I can contribute to the table instead of things that bother the, the, sh 
the guy on the side, you know, because he's different. His shape is bothering me. No, it doesn't matter. He can bring things and I can bring. So if you build this kind of platform in the middle and you turn everybody the attention to it, it works. And I think it really, um, it works. I think it's that, is that you forget your, you use your differences as something which is beautiful. I mean, if we all know the same thing, it's really boring over here. No? So if your students would come to Portugal, it would be about what they know from their own backgrounds, wherever they come from, uh, that would be for us the, the matter, the raw matter to also start discussing about what we have in front of us. Okay. In that place. We, we, keep, we keep in touch on that point. <laughs> yeah. But we're not going to spoil the time now because there's another question, I think, in the Q&A from Marike de Smets. Marike, yeah. please. Hello. Um, it's funny. Um, when uh, I heard you about participation group, um, I'm in my last year of um, interior design and uh, I'm working about a vernacular architect. Uh, and I was thinking about a part participation group between um, people who are a professional busy with um, architects, but also people who are just doing this for the hobby. But your participation groups you're working with, uh, are they people who are also professional uh, basket um, craftsmen works or are they just people who are uh, interesting to do this and working with you? Do you understand my question? Yes, yes. yes. Um, we have, uh, I think we have, until now we did two formats, three. One is that we work um, with professional craftsmen only, so that they come together and we really um, can go in depth of uh, improving or changing or collaborating in techniques and uh, in shapes and uh, critics, etc. What we showed in the residencies. Then there is another format um, which is more on the student education base, where you um, combine students and craftsmen, for instance. Um, but on only students and talking about the methodology behind it and uh, shaping this eye a bit, what we showed about the purpose of our of our practice. But we um, we until now didn't do workshops um, where we would invite um, amateurs or people who are just interested in um, and, and doing this. But of oh, yeah. course, it's I mean they were all professionals until now. But of course, it's possible but it's another i mean then you have to have another goal and you have to have another um well it, it always depends also on what you want to reach right uh, where you want to what's what's your intention to do right? and in our our intention um, mostly is really to um to share our vision with the professionals in order to give a continuation also to to their uh, to what they do. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So our motivation is that. That's why we focus. Okay. 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 Thank you for your answer. <laughs> Thank you, Marike. So I think we come to the end of uh, this going public. Uh, I would like to thank Albio and Katrin a lot for this engaging presentation and also for giving an insight on the meta levels of what is happening there in the south. Um, thank you very much. And also thank you to the audience for joining us. I will now give the floor to Lilith. Yes, to basically uh, repeat the thanks and then extend them also to you, Cherry, because I think uh, you brought these wonderful people to the school and uh, that is <laughs> fantastic. And I'm super happy to hear about the um, the new plans uh, the summer school so uh, the serious the, stuff the contact will stay i guess it's um it's, it's super nice so thanks a lot and um i hope to see you all uh, including our guest uh, to the next lectures in the series so stay tuned uh, follow us uh, you can find the program on the blog you can 
uh, sign up for the newsletter, which is basically the most uh, handy way to keep tuned, as to stay tuned on, on what we are doing. Uh, next week, there's no lecture, and the week after that, it's a lecture by Leonard Lowes. So, hope to see you all there. Have a great evening, and uh, let's meet soon again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye. <laughs> Bye.